Welcome. This is the Frequencies Podcast, and my name is Jonah Dempsey. I'm joined today by Ben Zen. Thank you for joining me, Ben. Hey, thank you for having me on. Yeah, so I'm really excited. Um, I We connected, what, about a month ago, and actually, before we connected, someone sent me a uh, really cool, like, laser cut kind of thing you were working on, um, on your Instagram. And... Yeah. I was so intrigued. Yes, yes, this is what I was sent. I was so intrigued. I thought, I have to meet this person. And and then we connected, and I, I don't know if you messaged me first, or I mess I think you might have messaged me coincidentally. I think we kind of, yeah. Yeah, I might, you might have seen it after. Yeah, I think I, I messaged you, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I saw maybe, it, but somebody else sent it to me. No, 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 somebody else sent me without, without. Yeah, a few the weeks before also. There was a few few reels with the same uh, with the same piece. So yeah, yeah, I might have made the round already before. Yeah, <laughs> you posted that reel and it really made made some waves there. So um, so I'm excited. And then, uh, and then we had some email correspondence and, and you, you really have come up with an incredible, I'm just going to go ahead and show the wheel um just let's see this is something that you just sent me just just a few days ago and i'm so excited about this um so so yeah also i should that, probably say that it's not all mine obviously like i'm just kind of like uh continuing the the, the graphic Okay. So, so where, where does um, where did it kind of originate, or or what is the? I mean, obviously the wheel we have. That's actually the, so I'm, I'm I'm still trying to to find out about it because I found the picture, but I couldn't find much uh, background. And basically, the the inner part is is my addition to it, and the okay. the, the outer part, the, the numbers and the, the I Ching and the the DNA was is is the the typical code on. Uh, kind of. Oh yeah, well I've I've seen that absolutely, and that is something yeah. um, that Ra worked on as well with uh, Richard Rudd and some some other people I know. Already back in the early two thousands in London, um, there were lectures by Ra that were transcribed by uh, Richard Rudd, where they go into the codons, and so so that is something I I have seen before. But what I'm curious about is things like. Oxidation stage, photosynthesis stage. I mean, this is so so cool, and I'm and I'm also curious about these symbols here, um, or, or those are just the planets. No, they're not the planets. No, I so, think they are runes. Yeah, it's runes. it's the runes, and it's probably somebody that just yeah on 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 top of the the system uh, of codons and and uh, hexagram added the added the runes, and that's why they double some of them, I guess, with different with circles or with squares. To get to the sixty-four, okay, um, yeah. and yeah, well, what I basically uh, learned, or, or, or what is, uh, yeah, like the centerpiece of my of the theory that I came up with, is that um, quite a few ancient symbols have this uh, this division in four pieces, like you can just see the wait, the simple cross of of the church, let's say. But yeah, also the um, what's called the shaman wheel. Uh, I can look for for a graphic in a second. Yeah, which yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Well, and if, and if I can share your um, here, can I give you permission to share, or you can you can message me the graphic and I can share it either way. Uh, do you want me to look up a? I can look up a shaman wheel. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's easy actually. Yeah, it's the most easy. And and the other symbol is, for example, is the what's called shamash, which is the 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 sun symbol of the Sumerians, which actually by chance I have here. It's uh, this symbol in the middle. Okay. Ah. And it's it, it's kind of uh, um, it's basically a circle split in four. And. Yeah, the, the heart of the theory is basically, I mean, like, I'm, I guess um, I, I mentioned maybe I'm 1-3, so, uh, yeah, I like to kind of find the, find the mistakes in systems as, as I learned. And, yeah, this is like kind of uh, exercising that, that, that quality of mine. And right. Here's your chart. I'm just kind of showing for, for folks at home so they can see. And, yeah, first line, uh, personality sun, gate six, line one. And then your uh, design sun 12.3 is actually my um, design north node. So that's kind of interesting. I always like seeing, and it's also conjunct your nodes. We're born only nine days apart. 
So, you know, uh, you and I, which is uh, parallel, it's always interesting. Yeah, and we have very, very similar charts in many ways. Many of the outer planets are in the same positions, and you were also born with the Jupiter uh, Uranus conjunction. Uh, there's Jupiter. Uranus. Yeah, I haven't seen yours actually. I was kind of curious to to do the oh, first yeah. uh, first chat without seeing the chart, and then just yeah, check it out later. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can send it, and I can or I can share it in a moment. Um, but uh, so, yeah, let me let me grab that. But okay, so yeah. So get... please, please, I'd love to hear more uh, more about this research you've been doing. I mean, it's really incredible. Uh, I'll put I'll put the wheel back up for folks to see. <laughs> So the wheel um, basically is um, uh, just my basic simple attempt to um, classify things <laughs> things that exist uh, into categories that that are clearly separate. And in this in this uh, theory, I would uh, let's say the things are separate when they are uh, they are contained in each other. So these four things that are in the center. It's basically the four things that exist in the universe, in my opinion, in in um, chrono chronological order that they appeared after the Big Bang. So starting and, with and radiation. Which order does it start at radiation, or which order does this go? I mean, yeah, radiation is the first thing that that was there after the Big Bang, and uh, that radiation. I mean, most of that stuff is from Wikipedia. So I just like basically fuse common science that that might change uh, in the future it's like not everything like 100 percent exact and i just basically use what we mm -hmm. currently teach in school to to combine it with with the new new ideas and i see that it moves clockwise like it starts in the Planck epoch and then the grand unification then it moves to the inflationary epoch and then electro weak elementary exactly. particles yeah and so on so so the, the 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 first quarter is radiation. I like oh these are like what about time? Um, they're not really symmetric as as they're represented there. No, the radiation phase is very short, for example. And at one point, uh, the radiation formed matter. So it's there was literally like a solidification happening. No, so that's uh, the second quarter is matter, and that's. The, the the point here being is like that matter radiates, but it radiates different radiation than the radiation that was there before matter. So that's what what what, what kind of separates them. No, the, the one came out of the other. There, the, the the new one is made from two things, not just one, but it's still clearly separate. Mm -hmm. So these two build kind of the first half of 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 all all of evolution. Uh, being also the, the the radiation phase being a more kind of feminine uh, uh, category and the matter being a more masculine. Hmm. And then is when the the big thing happened. That's why it's also the center line. That's why maybe in the in the cross of the church, for example, the center line is uh, it's a bit longer because that's when <clears throat> when uh, matter formed life. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. This kind of this center line here, where it gets to this halfway, yeah. Exactly. It's also like, yeah, between like, let's say, uh, just energy and matter and, and, and living things. It's, it's the real, that's the real uh, evolutionary or the big step, let's say. So then we have uh, microorganisms that are made from matter that radiates, that also radiate on top of that. And they all exist parallel to, to the matter that was existing before and the radiation that was existing before. So again, another step. And they're all kind of nested into each other. That's why the, the thing, I call it uh, an endomorph, because it's a tetramorph, the thing with the four faces, phases mm -hmm. or faces. Mm -hmm. But because they're all contained in each other, it's, uh, yeah, it's like endogenous or, or endosymbiosis, mm -hmm. which is the last step, which is where my theory <laughs> diverts from the, from, from the common theory, let's say. Because in my theory, multicellular beings like humans uh, and animals and plants are not uh, the same stage than unicellular prokaryotes, bacteria. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's not um, such a far-fetched claim. I mean, that absolutely makes sense that there is a qualitative difference when you move from single cell organisms into higher mm -hmm. forms of life. 
Yes, but the point here being is that that uh, you can only be a multicellular being if you have uh, unicellular beings contained in your cells. Mm. And, and, and this here being being again this this really important uh, uh, line between the the white and the red quarter. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, there is where where it gets to human design and and yeah to to the to the more interesting part of of the theory mm -hmm. because. Um, yeah, th this is what, in my view, explains um, the binary consciousness of humans. Mm -hmm. That is the that design is the kind of prokaryotic consciousness, ancestor. and yes. the personality is the eukaryote consciousness. Yes. Oh, wow. That is a really interesting. <laughs> so... And it's just like I mean I, I work on this pretty uh, pretty long time and there is a lot of it goes in a lot of different directions, uh, like yes, neuroscience, uh, cell 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 biology, microbiology, um, and but over the time, like kind of uh, joining all the pieces, human design like was almost not I couldn't get it out of the equation anymore. Like it uh, everywhere, it kind of fused and there was it's a lot of terms in human design that that fits with terms that i find on you uh, on, on wikipedia or on certain scientific papers and i uh, i just started to kind of fuse concepts like that were that seemed completely unrelated uh, and yeah and and big part of the theory is basically just this fusing of concepts so mm -hmm. if i understand anything right then then the voice it is or, or or was translated to Ra by his mitochondria. Ah, and, right. So the voice was kind of at the prokaryotic level or the level of the single cell consciousness, which is embedded within us. It's like a lower form, quote unquote, lower form of consciousness, but and, it's contained somehow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And which, which obviously, if you, if you look at the circle, it, it's connected to matter. And has matter in itself, and then obviously there can be hours of of talking and discussion about uh, if matter and the radiation also have forms of consciousness, which I would argue that yes. And so, mm -hmm. so when he talks about form principle, that's what I would call matter, and and the the, the communication is what I would call yeah, it's communication between uh, eukaryotic mind or what I call the uh, or, or science calls the. Uh, DMN default mode network and matter or the planets, which are obviously in in on in this chart in the same category, mm -hmm. uh, translated to to his mitochondria to him. Right, right. Like there's a sort of a movement from radiation to matter to the to the exactly. mitochondria and the single cells themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know there is some um, foundation for this in what Ra said, which is basically that every cell has its own crystal of consciousness, that every cell does have a crystal of consciousness. So that what he would call self-reflected consciousness would be you know, at this phase, I suppose. But there is non-self-reflected consciousness, just consciousness itself, uh, which is not necessarily aware of being conscious. But yeah, and this actually brings up... Um, I have a favorite French philosopher named Henri Bergson. And Bergson has kind of fallen out of favor because he famously had a debate with Albert Einstein that it was widely considered he'd lost. And it was sort of a moment in history, you know, in the 1920s where science superseded uh, philosophy or seemed to. That was about 100 years ago. There's actually a book that just came out recently about that, kind of revisiting that. And I think it's worth revisiting because Bergson had what's been called a vitalist view uh, of consciousness, but it's it's actually pretty incredible. And we haven't really found more compelling descriptions in the last hundred years. It's kind of like that level of research kind of stopped or paused. Um, but one of the things he says is kind of similar to maybe what we're talking about with the difference between the um, like eukaryotic 
I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but the higher you form of consciousness. Yeah, right, right. Um, and this, these lower levels, what he said is basically humans have become so complex. He did include mammals and other entities, other living forms as well. I mean, we could even argue yeah, plants have some, but that humans, he talked about a term that he called the gap or zone of indetermination. And he says something really beautiful about this zone of indetermination. What he says is that the lower life forms and progressively, and obviously it sounds kind of human exceptionalist, right? Like, oh, we're so special. But really, he's he's not trying to say we're so special beyond just the gap of indetermination has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as consciousness developed. And he explains what it is. And he says this zone of indetermination that when you look at other life forms, that they are very much determined by the material forces of their environment. But humans have a much larger impact. We determine our environment. But even a dog or a cat does to a degree. Even a deer makes a path in its environment. You know, it determines its environment somewhat. But he said that as this zone of indetermination increases, time surges into it and goes inside, basically, and we gain interiority, where we are no longer at the mercy of time, but we are able to sort of pause time in the space of thought. And from a paused time, we are then able to think. And what thinking is, is a sort of a an involution of time. It turns it inside out. So we are no longer determined by the material forces operating on us over time, but we are now able to operate with time in a different way. And he says there are two main things. Suspension of habitual reaction, like choosing not to eat, for instance, you know, hunger strike. Well, if you tell a dog, no, don't eat, the dog will try, it will try, eventually it will eat. That's because it has a gap of indetermination, but it's not as big as ours. You know, some human could actually not eat until the point of death because of that. You know what I mean? Um, but it's like this ability to suspend habit. And then the second thing is the ability to appeal to past experience. So he says, we can actually try or strive. And what striving is that he says, um, dogs and cats, they remember, but they don't try to remember. They don't try to forget. They're unable to strive in the space of memory in the same way that humans can strive in memory, if you see what I mean. And so he really uh, has this amazing theory of how human consciousness evolved to be a greater and greater gap of indetermination where we are essentially able to experience something like quantum indeterminacy. And then there's something like a subjective experience of a quantum waveform collapse when a decision is made. Because we could go here, we could go there. Whereas the lower life forms don't have this level of indeterminacy. So anyway, that's uh, but, yeah, no, I, his theory. Some, some parts... Well, I would say like it, it describes really nice maybe the the last the higher levels of consciousness or some somewhere between uh, humans and animals. But yeah, but that's where where my my theory gets rather um, erratic and outlandish for many people, because that's that, that that's where we get to. I mean, yeah, as I mentioned, the line between uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes is is the line between uh, design and personality, if you want, and the line between uh, mind the. the the, the higher mind, as as you describe it, and the lower mind. The the way I see it, though, is that especially the as there is pretty insane information coming from the other side in many cases. If I mean pretty um, yeah surprising information. So in in uh, in many ways, like also thinking that that the whole process is obviously one one unified consciousness. Uh, kind of splitting itself up and separating itself from itself to experience all its uh, different qualities. So obviously it's, it's kind of, it's also the yin yang, obviously it starts uh, with the first split that is really um, all the, all the light and all the darkness, let's say, and it continues further. And for right, you're reason, saying that the first split between uh, radiation and matter 
kind of no not necessarily like no, just the first split that uh, that that start the process because ah, before so you're and you're starting it right here between 1 and 43 and going exactly. clockwise exactly but it might be that the numbers have to be turned like you know like that's something for the future it's like it's still a sure. work. it's called on the wheel but it's it's still a work in progress now mhm mm mhm mm so right to, to find the best correlation because obviously in the human design yeah. wheel we go counterclockwise or we go you know and things like that uh, but that also i mean you can read the wheel either way um due to yeah, the way that the, the the, the motion of the planetary bodies, we notice them counterclockwise. But for instance, the nodes move this way. So this is the way that the nodes move, um, if you want to look at it that way. And this is also the way that the in human design, we follow, we use the tropical wheel for, um, you know, for activations. But then we use the sidereal wheel, which moves retrograde against it based on the wobble of the earth and the precession of the equinoxes. And so that actually does move in this order. It moves, I mean, in, in this, in this, um, in this uh, direction. So, right. Because going clockwise, going this direction, you know, from, from gate 43 to gate 47 to gate 45, this direction is the direction that we observe of the global cycles, because that's the direction that uh, the wheels move against each other. But then, of course, when we're watching the apparent motion of the sun along the ecliptic, it goes, you know, gate three, gate seven, gate nine, gate five. It goes counterclockwise. Um, but in any case, I, I see that this is this is kind of a visual representation of, of a very deep theory. And I see that perhaps some of the correlation to the positions of the wheel is up for discussion. Right. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they might just click, click, click um, on on something that yeah that currently I, I haven't figured out. Um, because yeah, I, I mean, most part, like literally, like the last weeks, I I just finished up more or less the the yeah the last pieces of it. So well, yeah, to just I, I'd love to hear more. I mean, if you'd like to present even just some on or just explain maybe some more of, of your theory, because it seems very far reaching and you've really developed it quite a bit. I mean, it's very exciting to me to hear. So, yeah, it's, it's quite, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a bunch more, but please, please. Okay. So uh, where's a good yeah, place yeah, to, to get maybe back to, to what, what you said before, because I, I, yeah, it's really my, part of my theory kind of sounds similar to, I don't know. I didn't remember the name from, from the, from the philosopher you mentioned, but. Oh, uh, uh, Bergson. Yes. 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 Yeah. That, that was Bergson. So, so uh, if you just think about that, it's uh, one consciousness that, that uh, separates itself. In that case, the prokaryotes would have, uh, let's say, bigger pieces of the, of the origin consciousness now, because the pieces always get smaller. So for this reason and, and many other reasons that, that I, I, I can, yeah, they're going to come up uh, over, over time when, when I talk about different parts of the theory. Um, and also just the, the fact that first prokaryotes kind of created us, no? I mean, that's also, that's big, big part of, 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 of this whole theory is uh, endosymbiosis and the, the, the proposed way of how multicellular life came, came to be. And that is that prokaryotes somehow joined and, and by, by chance or, or through um, parasitic kind of relationship, that's what science says, not what I say. I would say it was based on a, conscious decision and on something we would call guy i guess love even uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the, that because they have bigger slices and because also they have collective consciousness they they don't have a consciousness each of them so they are tribes mm -hmm. and then they have that's also why in in the graphic you can see that prokaryotes and mitochondria have around dna strands and we have linear which also describes very nice. The yeah, their their way of communicating is collective, and our way of communicating is individual. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's because they have really the bigger bigger yeah. slice, and there is then also less of them. Because if you look at tribes, there's a lot of bacteria, but still there is there is less of them. They they seem pretty big once you meet them, and meeting meeting can be many ways. Uh, uh, the the encounter with the voice is just one of them, but. But um, yeah, I could. I mean, there there is obviously spirits in the in the shamanic realm of ayahuasca. Um, there is 
demons uh, in in many religions. There's yeah, man, in my theory, most beings actually have a real life uh, kind of body and are in many cases prokaryotic beings that that live in or around your body. And through certain techniques, you can uh, get in contact with them, mm. and they they seem very uh, majestic, very powerful, very knowing, and very big. Which is why they have been many times misunderstood as gods, as spirits, or as many many other things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because our consciousness is kind of based. On, on on them on on their technology which where it's, it's getting really kind of deep is if you think about a prokaryotic uh, life form before um, multicellular life forms exist they, they they don't have any senses they have no eyes no arms they they don't feel they cannot see but they interact with their environment and they must have some form of of observing what's around them in my opinion Mm. And that's that's where really kind of yeah the, the 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 heart of the theory comes out, and that's that they uh, use something like echolocation or sonar. That means they create uh, waves. It might be even whatever neutrinos or yeah that that's like some sort of wave, light or electricity. That yeah, they I mean, send if, if each one has a crystal of consciousness that a neutrino can pass through, then it can transmit information, and. Um, I mean, it's it's almost like a holographic kind of yep. version where each uh, the theory of crystals of consciousness is that there's the base, which is the entrance frequency, tone, which is inside the crystal, and color is the exit frequency. And tone can be imagined almost like a hologram of a larger form. Um, so it's almost like you have all of these cells that. Um, somehow have an image of a larger form like you're talking about these consciousnesses um, there's a whole science of encounter in human design which goes into angels demons ghosts gods angels. entities angels. and yeah and aliens. right right and even aliens what people call aliens um, can just be perhaps the the largest it's interesting because they do increase in apparent size in the encounter where angels are the smallest and aliens are the largest. Not that they always appear large. I mean, obviously people have encounters with small gray aliens and so on, but that the level of the consciousness is, is so much larger. It's like getting to cosmic scale and, or getting to, you know, planetary scale rather, I guess. Or, um, but it's interesting because it's very similar. I, I do wonder if this, description uh, is very similar to what how Ra himself described, where he said that even though it appears as a single entity to us, like a single demon or a single ghost, that actually it's a bundle. And he said there are bundles of crystals. And you're talking about bundles of cells, but each cell has a crystal, so it's not actually that different. He was just saying that they can be disembodied, not even have a cellular representation, but bundles of crystals themselves he called them rogue crystal bundles and that a rogue crystal bundle didn't have its own self-reflected consciousness. We are the kind of, we lend our self-reflected consciousness to it. It simply filters consciousness and imparts a certain quality to it, but a very similar way of describing it. Yes. Yes. For me, I guess in, in, in my theory, probably the, the crystals would be like the, the 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 physical or or the energetic part of the of the source being that that's that's creating uh, that's kind of the interface between the two the two minds now the the um the binary consciousnesses and mm-hmm. obviously created by mitochondria and prokaryotes in order to observe the world so they because they don't have any other senses they actually live in the hologram Mm. And we we can through certain techniques turn off our our prefrontal cortex, and will actually enter to certain levels into into the hologram and can then uh, meet them, get certain information, and which is also I just heard uh, that today uh, saying the sentence that uh, consciousness is seeing, seeing, seeing. No, and this is also a big part of my theory that 
that visual representation existed before smell, before acoustic senses, before anything, because they they only see in this world. And and they create this world because they can probably even change their shape, how they appear to others. And this is where we get to the point of uh, which we call semantic semantic processing, which is the 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 way of the brain of when you think about the word table, you 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 see the picture of a table in the back of your mind, mm-hmm. and this is also what I would call the interface and the uh, yeah because like like the philosopher said now we have this this determination but what I would more say it's we have time, we have a lot of we have a very long life in that we our body does amazing millions billions of things per minute, complex things, and we don't have to think of anything, and. Mm-hmm. Science might say because it all just happens by chance, which is which is, which is pretty, um, pretty yeah. arrogant in my view. And yeah, I'm, I'm my my is, my my theory is also a lot lot of science critique um, because oh, you know, I lost track. How oh, bad? Um, mm-hmm. Where was I? Where was... Well, right, but but talking about the relationship to time, and I guess that um, yes. That, uh, yeah, and, and the, that the visual that in this understand. zone of indetermination we can say table, we can see a table in our mind's eye. Yes, and so so because uh, mitochondria kind of uh, does all the important stuff in the cells, and they create this hologram. And in case of of uh, of mitochondria, the hologram is part of our mind. Not like prokaryotes only use it; it's their mind and their way of uh, seeing the world and communicating. In mitochondria, it's kind of part of our subconscious. So we think of something, and they they send the image, and that's that's really what I would call the freedom of the self uh, of of the of our modern consciousness. You now that that we don't have to like our m- mind can do amazing things, like really complex things, but they feel really uh, light to us. You know, we can really surf through many topics. And we're still sitting in the green, and we can hear the birds sing, and and it's that that's the present what they gave us with with their like literally like with the death of of the of the unicellular being that became mitochondria. They gave us this freedom, no, and that's yeah, that's a big part of the of the theory that they actually pretty powerful, and they have actually pretty big con- pieces of consciousness, let's say, or or but but they are concerned with other things. Like they they concerned with matter and they 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 have instinct and they can show us the way and they can tell us information like the voice and you know they can if we learn the techniques and if we connect with our design or body or mitochondria however you want to call it then magic happens you know and yeah that's mm-hmm. why also there's so much in the literature and so many cases of encounters and magic and things that they don't, just don't make sense. With a with a normal view of the world, no, and I feel like, yeah, that's a big part of why why I create this theory just to explain things that were just too mysterious to me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm I'm really excited about this theory, and um, to me, I haven't encountered uh, anything in human design except perhaps Ra's material on base theory. I'm going to show a graphic for just a moment that that actually goes into these deep questions and so i think it's a really important um aspect of human design study so this is um this this is what ra came up with for base theory which is kind of half uh poetry and half deep contemplation into the nature of reality almost ontology and uh i have some notes here and this, I think, was from 64 Keys. They've kind of made their own graphics here. I'm happy to share all of this with you uh, as well, if it would help in, in your... Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. For sure. um, I haven't got much into base yet. Well, and, and, and uh, to be honest, hardly anyone has. I mean, it's a very unexplored or underexplored part of human design. Um, not even human design, the design of forms and the just d- design science, if you will. but um, Or what he would call rave cosmology in some sense. But uh, just to give an example, so these were the base glyphs. Um, These are kind of like they can it's it becomes difficult when you get to this level because there are so many 
ways to explain and understand base, all the way from personal characteristics, all the way up to macrocosmic principles. But just one way of explaining it, um, Ra said there were nine dimensions. There are the four dimensions of Einstein, the four dimensions of you know relativism, which are the three spatial dimensions and time, which is kind of special in that it can be used as a dimension, but it's it also has some peculiarities to it. But then there are five other dimensions that he really was clear we should think of them as dimensions. Dimensions in the sense that they're in some sense orthogonal to each other, that you can move in them independently. They're independent. Uh, you can freely move in one dimension and sit still in the other dimensions, so to speak. Um, but in any case, the uh, f base five is at the middle of the personality. This is the personality mat right here. And so five, the dimension of space, you can see some of the keynotes. Space is form. Form is illusion. Illusion is hearing. Hearing is music, music is freedom. I mean, these are very deep keynotes, very poetic, very poetic. But if, if I were to give a very simple explanation of what space is, it would be like the cockpit where it's our subjective experience of ourselves, our sort of subjective presence, the thing that says, I think, that experiences itself as being present in this cockpit. Now, from that cockpit, it has access to the other four dimensions, some of which don't have access to each other, by the way. Movement is not connected to evolution, and design is not connected to being, and so on. Uh, you can see that they're across from each other, so they have a sort of disconnect, and, and they're not directly connected. But our subjective experience, our sort of personality, has access to all of it. Now, just as a simple example, base one is movement pure movement. This is like when the whirling dervish is dancing and they go so fully into the base one dimension that they don't notice their bodies. They don't notice their mind or memory. They don't notice anything, right? They're so completely fully immersed in movement. Or like the athlete who is about to hit the ball and they merge with the ball or however it is, you know. Um, flow, flow state. It's called well, right? yeah, to, to a degree, yeah. It absolutely would be a, a kind of a, but a movement, yeah, I guess if we think of flow equals movement, then yes, the pure movement. However, I would almost say that there's a flow state is sometimes a description of being immersed fully. And so there's almost... Yeah, the, the important part is the overnatural part, like the, yeah, the, the um, to have special abilities. Like how yeah. it can feel different ways, but yeah, special abilities is yeah. Yeah, state. yeah, and that there might be different kinds of flow because, for example, base two, which is very different from movement, if you go fully into base two, you completely stop movement, and that's the dimension of the mind. And this is like I was talking about with Bergson, where he says we we are able to pause time and we're able to go fully into a we're able to stop the movement of the world by going fully into a mental space of memory. You see, the keynote here is about memory. Uh, gravity is memory. Memory is taste. How funny is that? Um, it was uh, actually I mean, smell as well. It can be smell and taste, but. Um, in this case, specifically taste, I guess. But uh, it was like Proust and his remembrance of things past, where he he goes into a reverie and he's lost in memory. And that's a 5,000-page book that's all about the realm of memory. And when you're so deep in your memory, you have no access to movement. When you're dancing and moving, you're at the you know Berghain and it's 6 a.m. or something, right? You have no access to memory. Uh, your memory is gone. And then being is actually has to do with the body. We see on this side, the body is biology. Biology is chemistry. Chemistry is objectivity. These are very deep keynotes. When somebody asks what's objective, it's actually the the body's experience. It's not subjective. Hunger is objective. Being 
turned on or turned off is objective and so on. And um, which is kind of a funny contrary idea to a lot of contemporary thought. But uh, basically the dimension of the body is its own dimension. And it's kind of like doing a yoga nidra where you enter fully into the sensations of the body. You have no access to movement. You have no access to the mind. And then finally, this is the one that I think is the most interesting um, in terms of its connection to what you're you're calling, um, sorry, let me pull that up again. Prokary, pr sorry, pro prokaryot, pr prokaryotic consciousness. Yeah, you can say unicellular. Uh, say unicellular. Unicellular, like, unicellular consciousness. Easier. Perfect, perfect. So the design is the one that's most interesting to that. You might think that it would be being since it's the body, but design. The principle of design is actually more like the visionary state, the dream world state, the state of, a, of image, of the imago and of the imagistic and the imaginal, not just imaginary, but what Carl Jung and others like um, James Hillman would call the imaginal, which is this visionary state that you like you have with psychedelics like you have in dreams and so it's funny that that is its own dimension so to speak that we have movement we have the mind we have the body but then distinct from that is the imaginal where when you're fully in this visionary state you have no access to the body you have no access to the mind and you have no access to movement and then the thing that that can move between these is space the personality. The personality is what goes into one of them and comes out of them. And and you can see that there's many combinations. I mean, you know, uh, when you're making love, that could be movement and, and being, you know, uh, together, because there's both of those together. Or when you're um, in your mind and memory, and the body is connected to memory, or memory connects to the design, and so on. Um, they, they connect to each other, except for pairs that don't connect. The body cannot connect to the design. Movement cannot connect to the mind. Uh, but the personality connects to all of them. So in any case, that's a very deep, deep subject and not something I expect we would talk about so much. I just wanted to kind of share because as far as the ontological kind of depth that you're researching, it's very rare to see in human design. And I think... Uh, it's incredible work you're doing. And, and the only other place I've seen this level of thinking is in Ra himself when he was doing his work on base. So I'm really excited, uh, excited to hear more of your theory. So is there anything else um, that we'd like to cover today? I mean, would you like to kind of lay out more of tell the story of how we evolved or, or I guess I just, just I find, find a few points that uh, to connect it a bit more to human design. Um, sure. Because yeah, that's probably, I, because also I figured like it might just be like probably only people that are a bit into human design might even be open to, to, yeah, to certain parts of it because yeah, it's, it's pretty far out, but yeah, it connects there to, uh, or it might explain quite a few things that, like I said, told you before that are still a little mystery in human design, like about where it came from or, or like more like logistic or sure, uh, systemic, absolutely. you know, but the information in itself, obviously, and what, what Ra did also like, uh, or what he said, is all pretty clear, but yeah, I feel like just there's a few little dots and well, the, the the main reason is also, for example, just the 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 realization that I had that 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 the four steps are based on the same kind of energy passing around the clock four times and provoking a certain a different outcome because things are evolving. No, but it's kind of it's it's the same same vibration and it's always based on the on the on the sixty four steps. So if you, if you think that uh, basically the, the phase of radiation was just uh, trying out different um, configurations of, of radiation, like now we know there is uh, infrared and, and, and uh, radio waves and all kinds of things. So it's kind of trying out all the combination based on, on, this, on, the, on the code of 64 colons or whatever, the hexagrams. And the same happens with matter, where the result then is the the, um, the periodic table, uh, and uh, then it happens with the, with life uh, and the um, 
protein folding and it's always kind of expanding in complexity. Uh, the, the next one probably is, we, we don't even know it, but uh, it's it's always based on on the same kind of calculations. And that's just why, uh, yeah, why, why the planets can actually influence uh, the, the body and, and, and the, the design, what is in, in, in my theory, for example, would be if the design gets uh, gets chosen 88 days before birth, there should be uh, something that we can measure in mitochondria of the embryo on that day, which will let us predict the day of birth and the hour of birth in the ideal case. So, for example, now there's quite a few things uh, to my theory or also to Ra's theory, as we have seen that if there's something to it, then it, there, there's really fixed things that will prove it and the things that we can look for, no? And this mm. would be one of the things, for example, to, to look for what happens 88 days before birth in the mitochondria, which is pretty small. We can't see much. <laughs> so, yeah, everything about mitochondria is going to be, um, it's a lot of, uh, um, yeah, just hypothesis because we can't see them. But Well, right. And I, I also, I've talked to people about this and there's different understandings of the 88 degree uh, change where what the most compelling understanding that I've arrived at through Ra's work on what he calls the camel and the dog, he basically explains that the voice described our sun as unique in the solar system or in the cosmos rather, because our solar system is essentially the Ajna center or third eye of the entire universe which is an unborn living entity that is kind of like in a fetus, in a fetal position. And it's like the third eye being formed. Or so the whole universe is within a womb, you could say. And the universe is the fetus itself. And because of the unique quality of the sun, Ra compared it to Sirius or to other stars or, you know, Arcturus and so on, you know, Aldebaran, that these other stars have two pieces to them, but the sun actually has three. It has the camel, the dog, and the core of the sun, we could call it, something like that. And he described that its relationship to Mercury was such that at any given point, the sun was not only transmitting the neutrino information of the current time, but it was transmitting a sort of one Mercury cycle before also which actually led me to question if it really is exactly 88 degrees of the sun or if it's like 87.89 or something. You know what I mean? Because um, I've wondered about that, but it seems like it is exactly 88 degrees. Um, but just because the Mercury cycle is not exactly 88 degrees retrograde of the sun movement. Anyway, that's beside the point. But um but the point being that at any given moment in time, at the actual moment of birth, the sun would be transmitting two neutrino qualities or values. It would be transmitting the position of all the planetary bodies at that point, as well as in that moment imprinting. So do you see what I'm saying? Because people have asked, how about C-sections? If it's a C-section, does this mean that all of time is predetermined? And I don't believe time is predetermined. I believe in quantum indeterminacy, that no choice doesn't refer to a sort of fatalistic predeterminism of all time throughout history, but rather we actually get to experience quantum waveform collapse. I'm not the first one to say this. There's a man named Roger Penrose and a man named Stuart Hameroff who's worked with him. And Stuart Hameroff yeah. talks about or microtubules. Yeah, they're the microtubules. They have their... Uh, X or, or, you know, they're kind of, you know, orchestration. Uh, Part of my theory, actually, yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're uh, familiar with them. I'm, I'm a big fan of their work. And so I kind of agree with Hameroff that we subjectively experience quantum waveform collapse. And because of this, it doesn't make sense to me that everything is predetermined. So my explanation is the moment of cesarean birth, for instance, is the moment of the imprinting. Basically, the, the fetus has come out of the womb, it's born into the world, and that both the personality and design crystal get imprinted at the same time, but that the design crystal gets imprinted with the imprint from 88 degrees before. 
See what I'm saying? Not that it was imprinted 88 degrees before, but that it gets imprinted at the moment of birth with the imprint from 88 degrees before. Because of yeah, the way that the I, sun is, I, is filtering. Yeah, that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be too important in my theory because uh, uh, mitochondria is, is, is what uh, writes your memory and does all the things before uh, you enter the vehicle, let's say. So, I mean, that, yeah, that's also like, I mean, science is pretty far ready on, on what mitochondria does in the in the embryo. And and embryo, anyway, is, is a nice uh, way of coming back because the whole thing that got me onto it is, I don't know if you know about Grof, uh, Stanislav Grof. Absolutely. And, and yeah, a holotropic breath work and... Um, and the four, four perinatal matrices, which are uh, the, the I'm not amniotic universe, which is the mm -hmm. state when the embryo is happily in the belly, which is uh, radiation. And then you have the when the uh, labor starts, which is kind of pressure and stress and the realization that this this wasn't all of it and something's going to happen. That's matter. And uh, the third step, uh, this, the third mat matrix is the actual birth process, which is kind of exciting and scary, which is the prokaryotes, which is uh, life and the first life in our in, in this theory. And the last step, and that's the interesting, because that relates again in my, my theory and what I just realized this week to, to human design and 2027 and the rave children, in the way that the last step is that is, is after birth. And the last step is when you realize that you haven't died and that, that this wasn't the end and before it wasn't the life. And which can be really harrowing or yeah, scary or it's just a weird experience in many ways. And it's a lot about doing something with this new life and accepting not not being sad or scared or 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 just against whatever is in front of you you know it's about getting up and accepting the new reality and doing something with it which is our step the fourth step or uh, eukaryotes multicellular being but also uh, the rave children in, in my theory again the the fourth evolutionary step of uh of multicellular beings and yeah they're they're the same now we are the we are the third we are the the stressy birth part the 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 scary the 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 getting out of the birth channel and and not knowing what's going on no and and they gonna be this this oh okay here we are what now no and i think a lot of yeah what's coming is gonna be uh, yeah we can learn a lot uh, studying the the fourth perinatal matrix of growth about yeah about us and about uh, the future, I think. Wonderful. And, and there's also, a, a, well, yeah, you have, I have a comment on Graf here as well. Um, so there's a man named Richard Tarnas, who's a good friend of Stanislav Graf. And he's also made an interesting connection between these four perinatal matrices and the outer planetary archetypes where Neptune is the Omniotic fluid and the sort of omniotic state of um, merging, of narcissistic withdrawal, of oceanic feeling, and so on. That's Neptune. Uh, Saturn is for him, I guess, what we would call the matter phase, which is kind of interesting because that, well, for you, you're describing it more as labor, but he would say Saturn is the building of the bones and the building of, in but human design, you look at it as the building of the centers, the building of the body. Solidification. No, no, it Absolutely. will fit perfectly because yeah, in the in the in the in the growth thing it's pressure, but it's yeah, it's well, but it I also in. wonder he may have Tarnas may have modified it slightly because when he talks about well, I guess yes, the pressure that solidifies, but then there is the the birth process itself, which he associates with Pluto, and that has its own volcanic pushing and its own pushing out. And, and that would be Pluto. And then he, um, his last phase is Uranus, which fits really nice with the theme of the age of Aquarius and this sort of ending point for consciousness. Because as you may know, in human design cosmology, the rave children is the last phase. Uh, we have about 1300 years until the end of the destruction of the earth, theoretically, at which point we enter into millions of years of being quiet and having no form in that sense, the, the lack crunch. of the, the death of self-reflected consciousness before finally incarnating again in a way that we can't even really necessarily call incarnate because it's not in carne, 
It's not in meat, but it's coming into a silicon-based life form called the Aeron. Um, so that's a very interesting, uh, it's almost like our sci-fi stories of robots or, you know, Ray Kurzweil and people who believe we're going to merge with the machine and people like that. Singularity. It's not going to happen, but it's a story that mirrors the story of the eventual evolution into the Aeron, which is a silicon based life form that cannot die. However, that's after hundreds of millions of years of being disembodied personality crystals after the destruction of the Earth. So it's kind of funny. It's like the same story is there in human consciousness, it's being told in many different ways. It's just not so literal. It's not that we will literally upload ourselves to the internet and live forever. It's that many years after the destruction of planet Earth, we will once again take form in a form that is metaphorically similar to, to the AI or the computer or something like that. So anyway, it's quite a quite a deep area of conversation, but I, I I love this idea. So in any case, Tarnas puts this as the Uranian, and the he says if you look at the symbolism of uh, Uranus, in fact, his first the first ast astrological work I read, or I, I'm 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 aware of his. The first book I read of his is Cosmos and Psyche, but before that, he wrote Prometheus the Awakener, and was kind of uh, responsible for helping astrologers understand the Promethean characteristic of Uranus as awakening. And so it makes sense that he would identify this as the moment of a newborn baby opening its eyes for the first time. And when it opens its eyes and it sees the new world, that's the Uranian experience of a flash of awakening into a new phase of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, that also is, is, I guess, one of the things that really is I, I got to do now is like make a big wheel and just fill it with all. Yeah, I have a long list of process already that I'm kind of like putting in, in each category you now. And yeah, it's going to be a big one because there's a lot of processes you can kind of uh, superimpose. And yeah, I really like the the kind of um, uh, geometric part of it and symbolic part, like, yeah. Well, it helps yeah. to see it visually. And there is actually, there was a book a few years ago on diagrammatic thinking, which is a movement in philosophy um, towards more visual representations. Uh, and I, it really helps. And also I think of spiral Wait, how dynamics, diagrammatic thinking. If you look up uh -huh. diagrammatic thinking, there's a, there's a book on it that made quite a splash a few years back in contemporary philosophy. And people like um, like Zalamia, there's a website, let me see, it's called, I can send it to you, it's uberty.org. And they have a lot of very hip um, philosophical kind of neo-rationalism, but they also get into, like I see they one of the top authors they have there is Scott Aronson. I'm a huge fan of Scott Aronson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He often debates with... Um, Who's the guy from Less Wrong, the founder of Less Wrong? Well, anyway, he debates with these um, these figures. Let me see. It's uh, yeah, Scott Aronson, and uh, he he talks about quantum computing a lot and artificial intelligence. Um, and and in any case, it's yeah, it's a really it's a good. Um, well, I have a whole chapter on on visual thinking. On of my my, my my opinion is that many people that are trying to find the world formulas and 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 kind of mathematical solutions to problems should uh, do a lot of visual thinking because yeah, it's really what how our subconscious works and how how you get things out of it is is working and thinking visual in in some case at least in my case for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just sending you a few of these links, uh, diagrammatic thinking. Yeah, visual thinking, diagrammatic thinking, it's it's very important. And then um, the other thing that I was kind of reminded of is spiral dynamics, um, Ken Wilber's integral studies and things like that. And I've, I've never been a big fan of his, but I have a lot of friends who are, and so I definitely don't want to detract from that. I think it's just... Um, I, I never was able to really connect to Ken Wilbur, but I also know that spiral dynamics has moved beyond his original work in that field. And so, um, 
it's something that comes up sometimes and, and people talk about, um, and that does seem, and there's even a form of human design that came into, into my, you know, awareness, uh, some months back called integral human design. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. Um, but I, I do have some interesting conversations with a friend and colleague, uh, Brandy Jordan, who works in spiral dynamics and she uses, um, really the, her work, she's actually giving a talk this year at the High Desert Human Design Conference on spiral dynamics or the spiral of everything, as she calls it. And she uses the six lines of the hexagrams as her sort of fundamental key for everything. So even more than a fourfold division is this sixfold division. Um, and the deep understanding of the six lines, which also repeats at different levels in human design, like the six colors and the six tones, and even the five bases plus one extra line, which doesn't really have a base. It's kind of a synthetic line or a transitional line that's added um, that doesn't actually have its own dimension. It's like the five dimensions plus no dimension kind of create the six lines, if you will. Um, and there's a certain continuity there between between them. But, well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Are there any other areas um, you'd like to to talk about? Any anything in particular, or maybe we can pick this back up a different time? I'd love to have you as a guest again. I mean, I'd love to be kept in the loop of of your researches and your studies. I mean, this is an incredible. Uh, this is really really interesting work, and I'm I'm so glad that you're doing this work because I think it's, it's important. This is, this is ontology. This is the true work of questioning the nature of reality and how we got to be where we are um, and making sense of things. I mean, when I look at your chart, I see that uh, you have the 6447. And so it is here to take, it, I mean, it, it is a visual thinker. It really, I mean, that's a big part of it. It's here to take, um, to take the mix of images and to put them into some order and to make the connective tissue between the images in a, and to create a way of making sense of these images. Um, and that's what you're doing. And it's very, I see you have a very imagistic mind. Uh, this, this. Yeah, this is also abstract, is abstract, I guess, no? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of, like theology and yeah, mysticism and like, yeah, the theory is full of it. I, yeah, I was also just thinking, I mean, if you're, if you're interested, like, I mean, I, I have a few things on, on archetypes. Please. I, I would love to hear. Yeah. And we have all the time. We have all the time we'd like. I mean, there's no rush at all. I, I am. I mean, we have all the time. If you're curious to hear that, it's all pretty short anyway. But oh, please. I'd love to. Yeah. Well, what I figured the last weeks, what, what I would consider an, an archetype is uh, somebody that has uh, over their life managed to successfully connect uh, with their design or, or live their design, let's say, or in my theory, to, to turn off his, uh, his prefrontal cortex or his, his um, default mode network and exit, access the mitochondrial consciousness long term and thus as true 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 this and its actions also in 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 the collective consciousness let's say uh leaves an echo and in future times if you connect with your mitochondria with your body with your design however you want to call it they come out of you and they kind of a helper software they're like echoes from the past and especially if you go to places or you have the same design of of those people or planets or bacteria gods then they're gonna come out of you and 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 they they try help you to 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 find more connection and if you continue you become an archetype now that's just like if if it really works you become an archetype so when they appear obviously that's why they they do a lot of harm also because yeah <laughs> it's, it's hard, to, really, hard to work with these kind of things if you don't I understand love that. Well, it's so beautiful because it's it's kind of what's been described in myths of the past of the great warrior or the great shaman or the great queen or however, after they die, they become a star, you know, and they kind of turn into a star and they're added permanently um, to the firmament. And there's a really beautiful idea there of 
we get to return or become a part of the collective consciousness field where, or what Jung called the collective unconscious, where um, we are accessible in the future. And, you know, I, I had similar ideas. Uh, I, I love your way of articulating that. And that is such a beautiful way of articulating it. I've had similar ideas of when, when um, like a writer of the past is able to really express their consciousness in such a way that you, you no longer are trying to get a handle of who they are or access them, but you essentially get direct access to their essence to where the qualities of that person no longer seem like coincidences added, but rather seem like obvious expressions from a fountain or a wellspring. And then it's, it's basically this idea that there's a shift like I'm reading a new thinker, I don't really get them. I don't really understand them. Maybe they haven't conveyed what they're saying, or maybe I haven't been able to access that. But at a certain point, I am able to identify with them and access that. And from that point on, once I know, I mean, the essence of them, or I have some connection to that, it's almost like I could have a conversation with that person just in my imagination where I have an idea and then they respond and comment on that idea. And, and so I, and this has happened many times with different thinkers, different philosophers, different writers, where in the beginning, I'm sort of surprised and I'm sort of, oh, this is interesting. And I'm kind of tickled by writing them. But then at a certain point, I become so familiar that it no longer seems surprising in some way. It's more like, what would Ra say about this? What would Jung say about this? What would, you know, and then you can kind of imagine what they would say. And it's not just imagining though, there is a sort of access to a consciousness, which is perhaps even one of the meanings of the doctrine of eternal life. That, um, for instance, do you know the, the wonderful poet Rumi? There was a, a beautiful poet, Rumi. Um, Rumi, R-U-M-I. He's a fantastic poet, Sufi mystic. And he was 38 years old before he wrote poetry. And he was a scholar, but very dried up and intellectual and had no connection to the spirit, really. And then he met a man, Shams Tabrizi, Shams Al-Tabrizi. And um, Shams, they were good friends and in some ways even in love in some sense, in some sort of platonic way. Um, but these, they were men living in the 1200s and so on. And I, I, don't, I don't even know if I don't, I mean, Shams was a very old man. It was a very pure love, but in any case, Shams was killed and it broke Rumi's heart. And for the rest of Rumi's life, he wrote poetry to Shams and he began later to sign it Shams. And he said that he truly realized that Shams had not died, but lived on in some sense. And I think this is kind of what we're talking about, where there are all these metaphors of eternal life. And, and maybe in some sense, it is true through the mitochondria, through the design, through these, these other levels uh, where it's like cellular memory that maintains the uh, consciousness in some sense and is only really accessible through the multicellular consciousness that reconstitutes or accesses it, but is nevertheless there in the unicellular consciousness in some sense. I'm not sure if, if that's exactly it, but at least metaphorically, there's a sort of uh, something really beautiful here about, about the ability for consciousness to live on and to, to be, and I mean, it's also very similar to what Ross says about the, crystals continuing, the crystal can't be destroyed. So the design crystal goes into the bundle and the earth's mantle. The personality crystal either goes back to a personality crystal bundle or to a rogue bundle. But either Perfect. way, the crystal of consciousness sticks around. It can't really be destroyed. Um, so there perfect, is uh, kind of, I mean, like I had like two, three no more notes. So, and this was like kind of a perfect, uh, how you say, um, yeah, like transition to there, because yeah, th th that's like basically the the process of uh, three days not being moved after death is, in in my opinion, very similar to the eighty eight days before the design gets uh, determined, uh, such that before the design gets determined, uh, the mitochondria of mother and father are kind of 
trying out all possible combinations that could be you. And on that day, they decide the, the mitochondrial DNA. And on your birth, they decide you, your DNA, you know. And, the, and when you die, they kind of do the same, kind of sorting your memories, sorting your experiences, but, uh, kind of putting them together. And then passing them on to, to, to special tribes of, of bacteria that live in the mantle of the earth. That I would also say, for example, that the, 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 the godheads, what is it, 16 godheads? Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that these are 16 very important tribes of bacteria that are living very deep down in like 50, we, we find bacteria up to 50 kilometers now down and, and lower. And huge amounts, like they, they are like more than, than all uh, mammals by weight, much, much more than that. Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. So you're really finding the material corollary yeah. to the collective unconscious. You're finding the actual living organisms that are maintaining the collective consciousness field. Wow. Yes, but holographically. And, and it's about, but, but I think it's almost, it's even physical matter will be involved in the process. So there is a holographic uh, component to the to the three days after your death, but then it's literally like multicellular uh, beings eating you, bacteria eating you, and writing the information in their uh, feces, which in many cases is actually crystals, which is very insane. Like there's a various um, species of bacteria that are actually eating stone and forming stone and, and, and consuming minerals that are left over from, from bodies, for example. And yeah, it could be literally like engraved in, in stone of the planet. And if you have the right technology, you could read it out now. So yeah, this, I this love that. Just, what a, this is, um, a quote, a, there's a beautiful and mysterious quote from Hegel from the great philosopher Hegel. And, uh, he said, the spirit is a bone. And this statement has been very confusing to scholars because it's a very mysterious statement, but he was trying to talk about the uh, sort of ultimate union of spirit and matter in one. And it's kind of an interesting idea here. You could almost say the spirit is a stone as well <laughs> in this case. So, yes, yes. Or, or it can be it's one, one, one of its stages, let's say. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one of its, exactly. And uh, I'm also thought of, there's a, I also think of uh, a philosopher, shaman, he isn't alive anymore, but his name is Barry Long. And Barry Long, um, somewhat controversial figure, but he had some very interesting things to say. He was an Australian mystic, really. And uh, he has a really beautiful description of, I, I can send it to you. It's, it's, it's basically, it's, he calls it the myth of Draco. And he uses this image of a dragon whose head is in deep space and his tail is within the deep, within the recesses of human consciousness. But he also says it's in the earth's mantle. And in fact, let me just, um, this would be a nice, I'd love to read just a moment of this for you, because I know exactly where it is. It's called The Myth of Draco, and it's from his book, The Origins of Man and the Universe. And so, um, yeah, let me just let me just read a moment of it. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, okay, one moment here. Uh, yeah, the character of myth and the draconic transverse. Really beautiful. So... He says, um, the, the, basically, Draco is what he calls yang and yin, and it's the profound cosmic principle of yang and yin, the mythical bridge between outer and inner. Yang is behind the apparent external created by our looking out consciously into the unconscious streaming down onto the surface of the earth. Yin is behind the unconscious within. Yang the head of the dragon is all eyes, a huge platform of celestial perception. From the vantage point in deepest space, light years beyond the solar system, the Yang principle of Draco presides over time and events which on Earth are represented by life and death, the dynamic behind terrestrial evolution. From the Earth's viewpoint, Draco's tail, Yin, ends deep in the unconscious of the human mind 
beyond the psyche, within the mind of the earth, the mind of the one earth spirit. Between the head and space and the tail within is the serpent's body. This is man and all the species, both living and dead. So really a beautiful mythological wow. way of you know describing Amazing. this. And uh, I'll send it to you because it's a really beautiful poetic way of describing. And he starts the whole thing saying he's going to speak in myth because myth is the closest we have to truth at this level. So it's kind of a, I, I, he, he may have had 64, 47 as well. I'm really not sure, but. Uh. Well, well, also, yeah, quite, quite a big piece also on, on, on uh, kind of coincidental encoding of information that uh, once you have the big picture, you can clearly say that the person that has written it was not aware of all all the layers of what they were saying. No, so this is also a big part of of this, yeah, mitochondrial kind of uh, intervening in 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 our consciousness. No, so there there might be information that we can take out also from from Ra. Um, that yeah, there's a lot of uh, layered information I think in 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 many things that yeah that can be extracted. Mm -hmm. No, and yeah, I really enjoy that kind of yeah. yeah so really, really interesting. Me every yeah. Single well, and this might be a, just what one side note I kind of thought of during his encounter with the voice. And um, if you haven't seen it, Ra's Encounter is a wonderful yeah. movie. Oh, you've seen it. Okay, good, good. Yeah, five, ten good. times. Minimum. Okay, good. Yeah, me as well. Well, um, some people have turned it off when it gets to the credits, but if you keep watching or, you know, there's a second part of it after in the whole first part where yes. he tells the story, he's sitting and then the second part is like questions and answers. And during that part, he mentions that there was a, a part of his encounter with the voice where he was directed to a textbook, a Stanford biology textbook, uh -huh. and opened to a page on quadraparentalism, on having four parents, that there are these rats that they were doing tests on. Could a rat have four parents rather than two parents? And he was really curious about that. And I've wondered about that in, in base theory, if the personality crystal has for parents of the other bases, basically because the personality crystal is thought to have been a fragment of the crystals of consciousness that shattered in the Big Bang. But I also wonder if there's some connection to the mitochondrial DNA or that we're actually taking in four streams rather than just two streams in some sense. Um, I don't know exactly what sense that Yeah, I also be, just took note yesterday about four streams of consciousness now like uh, i don't know where i have it but somewhere i just yeah listen was reading or listening and i just yeah that that consciousness always uh, appears in four streams now that is yeah there's yeah there's a long list of, of parallels mm -hmm. um, yeah well okay well do you have anything else you'd like to cover today anything in your notes that you'd like no, to? I, guess, I mean i i got loads but i guess for i don't even see the time but i guess for now it was a, well, I yeah, think this is a wonderful good. introduction. I mean, I, I would love to have you back um, as soon as you'd like, and we could we could make this an ongoing, regular thing if you're willing to continue uh, exploring these areas. Um, I, I love yeah. the research you're doing, right. and it's extremely fascinating, and I think that this is a, a wonderful introduction to the kind of things you're thinking about, and then perhaps we can, we can dig in more. Um, next time. But yeah, this has been a real treat for me. Uh, I'm very, very excited to continue these conversations. So thank you so much. And you said you have a Twitter yeah. now. You're starting on Twitter? Yeah, well, I, I have a Twitter. It's a Circus of the Gods, which is kind of the, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the current name of the, of the hologram. Or, the or, Circus or, of yeah, the or, Gods. I love that. Yeah, that's, such a, that's such a fun... That's so great. And is it just twitter.com slash circus of the gods? Uh, yes, I would actually have to check because I made it some time ago. Yeah. But yes, Endosymbiosis just, yes. Can, I see your title. Uh, Endosymbiosis contains the answer to our deepest questions. Well, this is fantastic. So that's I'm excited me, yeah. to, uh, to see what you post on there. And uh, yeah, I've already thought of a number of other fun connections. I want to talk to you about Leibniz and I want to hear more of your thoughts on the unconscious. And I think it's, um, I got some advice from a, a friend who's a writer and she said, always park uphill, meaning 
if you're writing or if you're doing anything, it's always nice to have more than enough that you're excited about for next time. So I think this is a good time to call it. It's been a wonderful chat. And uh, since we have parked uphill, we haven't yet exhausted by any means um, the depths of uh, exploration. And I think uh, this I'm looking forward to next time. So yeah, perfect. thank you no, perfect. for being on. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, to have you back soon. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. And yeah, I also I gonna order everything a bit and yeah, make a bit more uh, make it a bit more digestible and maybe yeah, have a lot of yeah small add-ons and yeah. Excellent. And, well, I'm really excited and let's do this again soon. Well, thanks all. Thanks very much, man. Have a great one.